better side of the moon. <laughs> well, thank you, um, um, the, uh, dear chairman. Uh, thank you, the organizing committee, it's, uh, for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be in this fantastic meeting uh, again. Um, well, the first thing I noticed when I, I saw the title of my presentation was the exclamation point at the end of it. And I said, oh my God, that's probably because nobody believes that. And then I felt a little better because I thought, because I saw that there was an exclamation mark at the end of the, pre of the previous presentation as well. I said, okay, nobody believes that either. So the, 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 the thing is that, as this is not a matter of faith, but a matter of science, that I don't think we still have the scientific data to rely on and build our belief system. So let's go through this data very quickly. Actually, most of them have already been presented by the previous presenter. We don't have randomized controlled trials on, on Bobby patients, okay? All of them have been excluded from, from all randomized trials. We only have observational data. The observational data from the first years, I mean, at the beginning of the decade with the early generation valves were not as good uh, in terms of the device success, the uh, two plus or more paravalvular leak or new pacemaker implantation. And this is depicted in this meta-analysis, which included studies mostly uh, using first generation devices where there was a more, a, a higher rate of PVL in BAV patients, a high rate of conversion to surgery, a lower device success rate, device success rate and it's by the similar pacemaker implantation. And then we moved to second generation devices, to new generation devices, and we, we, we saw better results there. We saw that the paravalvular leak uh, uh, decreased significantly, as so did the, uh, uh, the device success rate. And at uh, this presentation, one year later from the bicuspid tower registry as well, uh, we, uh, we saw not that not only the uh, new generation devices gave us better results in terms of conversion to surgery, second valve implantation, paravalvular leak or absence of device success, but actually the difference that, that they were there with the first generation devices between tricuspid and bicuspid patients in terms of these parameters, they were not longer there. And on top of that, the uh, all cause to year mortality were similar. And then we have this presentation already uh, presented uh, from Dr. Makar at the uh, um, ACC uh, 19 uh, that showed, I'll go very quickly through that because it's already been presented, uh, after propensity matching of almost 3,000 patients, uh, well-matched groups, uh, slightly higher uh, rates of conversion to open surgery and annual rupture and bicuspid valves and 50% uh, higher stroke rate and 21% higher pacemaker rate in bicuspid uh, patients. But still the overall complication rate was indeed excellent. And all the other parameters uh, were excellent too. Hemodynamics paravalvular leak uh, quite impressively uh, and the, uh, uh, the improvement of quality of life in terms of New York Heart Association class and Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire was, were also similar between bicuspid and tricuspid patients. So how do we interpret these results? Well, as usual, there are two points of view. There is uh, the enthusiast and the skeptical. And the enthusiast in this uh, particular situation was the surgeon, it was Dr. Reardon, who said that it would be very hard pragmatically and ethically for me to randomize anymore. And I also think we have enough data on surgical bicuspid valves in this lower, grid, um, lower risk group that we can draw on for objective performance criteria. And then the skeptical is the cardiologist, Dr. Macker, who's actually the presenting cardiologist, and that's, that's, that's the view I, I, I agree with, who said that this data is reassuring and encouraging, but we must not get carried away. For high risk and intermediate, it's okay to consider uh, TAVR based on CT anatomy, uh, but for young patients, we have to do a randomized clinical trial. And a lot of people actually considered that bicuspid anatomy was a role of contraindication. Uh, like I, think we, I, I think we can blow that myth away if we carefully select our patients. But at the same time, I don't think we can say that the 60-year-old bicuspid uh, patient with a heavily calcified virus is a candidate for tablet. That would be a disservice. And from that statement, I will not keep the, the word disservice, which is a very strong word. I agree with that, but it's, a, it's an opinion. I will keep the if we carefully select our patients phrase because that's a fact. And uh, my point here is that the reported by CASPID patients have been highly selected patients by the local heart teams. 
This selection is, is, is done based on clinical and anatomic criteria, sometimes using, using highly sophisticated um, uh, imaging technology. And actually, the, um, the percentage of, of patients treated with tavir by caspid patients is in the range of 2 to 6 percent. It's, it's 3.4 in this huge uh, SDS-TVT registry uh, presented before. So is that real life? No, it, 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 it's not. Uh, actually, from this big uh, study, we know that more than 50% of operatively excised stenotic aortic valves after we, uh, we, we, we take out the rheumatic heart disease are congenitally malformed. And these are uh, uh, usually in, in young patients, I mean, in, in, in patients less than 60 years of age or equal to 60 years of age, 84% are congenitally malformed valves. If you want to look at the data uh, in, an, in a different form, 6 to 1.7% of patients with congenitally malformed valves, most of them are, of course, bicuspid, are less than 70 years old. Those are very young patients. And that brings up automatically the, uh, the issue of durability, of course. And we have a lot of durability studies, not a real a lot, but uh, some durability studies that have showed up lately. Uh, for, for, uh, for a follow-up of up to eight years with good results, um, BVF by, by uh, prosthetic valve failure of 0.58%, um, here of 7.9% at eight years. In this UK TAVI registry, no BVF, severe, moder severe and moderate SVD at the, uh, about 9%. Uh, and this uh, Nostrum trial, uh, who showed the BVF for both uh, uh, SVR, I mean, um, uh, surgical AVR and transcatheter AVR, uh, about 7%. Here, interestingly, the uh, transcatheter AVR had a higher, uh, a better rate of, of SVD, but uh, my point here is not, I'm not, I'm going to analyze these trials. I, but the point here is that these trials are not really very long-term uh, uh, trials, and they have two common features. The first common feature is that they have, they have all included very old patients. Uh, if you do not have the time to look at the ages of the patients included in these studies, let me go through the slides again. 83, 81, 79.3, 79.4. So these are 80-year-old patients. So the question is, can we extrapolate the evidence from this TAVI durability series to younger bicuspid aortic valve patients? Let's, let's see what happens for, for, for the surgical uh, bioprosthesis. This is the Kaplan-Meier freedom from explant due to bioprosthetic valve failure, I would say, in, in patients older than 70 years old, about nine years uh, after the implantation, and it's 100%, and it remains Sorry, it remains this way for almost up to 20 years. But when we go down to 60 to 70 range or to less than 60 years old, then the uh, curves dramatically uh, uh, change. And if you see the probability of reoperation due to uh, BVF for uh, uh, an 80-year-old patient at 20 years is only 7%, but for a 50-year-old patient goes up to 40%. So the answer to this question is most definitely not. If you look at this, at this graph of a big meta-regression analysis involving 42,000 uh, surgically implanted valves, you'll see that the age of 65 is a critical point. After the age of 65, the mean time to valve failure is 21.4 years, but before the age of 65 is only 14.5 years. So I would consider for a less than 65 year old patient and most definitely for a patient of less than 60 of 60 years old according to the european guidelines i would consider even putting a mechanical valve in, and i would discuss that uh, very uh, uh, extensively with my patient now the second common point of these tavi durability valves is that they all included tricuspid patients so is there any difference in, in durability, uh, potential difference between, between uh, tricuspid and bicuspid patients? It might be, because as we know, the, the eccentric calcium that there is there might lead to uh, uh, eccentricity, a lower expansion of the valve at all levels. 
and this has been confirmed by the study where the previous presenter is, uh, is the last author that showed that prosthesis under expansion is constantly observed in bicuspid patients. So this asymmetric expansion, there is a theoretical concern that it might lead to early degeneration of the leaflets. Is that a, uh, a reason for the less pronounced reverse ventricular remodeling seen in these patients after TAVR, uh, as reported in this, uh, in this study? I don't know, but that's another theoretical concern. Now, let's, let's go very quickly to this huge issue of, of, of aortopathy. Well, this is a, a, big, a big issue, of course, and I could go on for that for, for hours, but the, the bottom line is that patients with bicuspid valves, as you all know, have a, uh, um, a, a, an, an aortopathy. Uh, in 86.2 times more frequent aortic aneurysms than patients with tricuspid aortic valve. And uh, although the um, uh, overall incidence of dissection is low, still it's, 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 it's higher, it's considerably higher than uh, in patients with tricuspid valves. And there are a lot of studies showing that we'd be very aggressive replacing these ascending aortas at the, uh, at the diameter of 4 to 4.5 millimeters. Uh, Randall Grip uh, does a bendel procedure for a patient who needs uh, AVR uh, if the uh, aorta is 4 to 4.5 millimeters and the uh, anticipated life expectancy is more than 10 years and has excellent survival curves as opposed to the to other guys who don't do that. But then there are other studies showing the aortic dilatation is not a significant predictor of survival after adjusting, adjusting for other variables. And as a matter of fact, in this study as well, uh, after operating uh, on patients with uh, uh, an a dilatation of 40 to 50 millimeters uh, 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 during their AVR, there was no difference in survival between bicuspid and tricuspid patients. So the truth is that bicuspid patients are not as bad as Marfan patients in terms of their aortopathy, but obviously, obviously there is an increased cumulative incidence of thoracic aortic aneurysm and thoracic aortic surgery uh, compared to tricuspid, uh, to tricuspid patients. And these divergent results are depicted on these fluctuating cutoff values for elective ascending aortic replacement seen in the, in the guidelines through the years, both European and American guidelines. And we still we also know that there is heterogeneity not only in the um, morphology of the valve, but also in the aortopathy phenotype. And it looks like the, the aortic root phenotype is more aggressive in terms of, of long-term prognosis. Anyhow, there are several statistical challenges and problems in, in, in uh, bicuspid aortopathy research. Uh, a study like that might be true, and study like that may be true too uh, if the uh, the truth looks uh, looks like that so we we can only find out if we do really big trials like this one with 10,000 individuals but this is expected to be completed in in year 2033 that's a long time in the meantime we cannot ignore the fact that there are findings suggesting the presence of a fundamental cellular abnormality in bicuspid thoracic aorta and we cannot we cannot ignore uh, possible adverse uh, sequelae of these radial forces exerted by the transcatheter by oh my god how, how, how do I do that exerted by um, uh, the uh, transcatheter valves at, uh, at the uh, pathologic substrate of the aortic media. Anyway, I'm coming to my um, conclusions now. And the key points are that the evidence we have so far regarding TAVI in bicuspid aortic stenosis is derived from selected patients and cannot automatically be generalized and suboptimal anatomic factors such as the elliptical shape of, shape of the annulus or the eccentricity of calcium distribution may be associated not only with the high rates of annular rupture or conversion to surgery or stroke or permanent pacemaker implantation, but also with the lower and asymmetric expansion of the transcatheter valve potentially contributing to early degeneration of the leaflet. And the young age of the majority of these patients poses the question of long-term durability, I would say very long-term durability, more emphatically than ever. And there are more unresolved, unresolved issues that include concerns about less pronounced reverse left remodeling in these patients, left ventricular remodeling, I mean, and to comment on bicuspid aortopathy. So I think the key message is for most 
of the bicuspid aortic stenosis patients, we don't really do anything regarding TAVI. And as a rule, hence as a rule, and especially in younger and lower risk patients, please refer your patients for surgery. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dimitris, for your fantastic uh, presentation. Uh, this is a field uh, for uh, <coughs> excellent uh, debate between uh, cardiologists, interventional cardiologists, and uh, surgeons. Uh, is there any comment from the audience? Well, let, let me uh, say that out. We're not opponents. We're both in the same team. We're yes. struggling for the best of our patients. Okay, so, so we're, not, we're not confronting each other. Okay, so let's, we're trying to, to find the best solution based on data and not on our gut feeling. That's like the idea. To, to provoke, to provoke you. Okay. <laughs> uh, which is your opinion about uh, tricuspidization? Uh, the correction, uh, anatomic correction of the bicuspid uh, valve. I don't know that. What, what do you mean? To make uh, three three cusps. Uh, you mean surgically? Yes. There is a, a tricuspidation. Tricuspidation is the anatomic correction from bicuspid valve to tricuspid. Well, and surgically, you mean? Surgically. Well, well, I don't think that works. I've never done that. Uh, yeah. I don't think that works. It's a, uh, these are severely calcified uh, yeah. uh, um, uh, valves that we cannot actually uh, do anything about them. We cannot correct them. We just we can only take them out. We can only you can only excise them. Any other opinion? From no, no. Let's uh, let's take the confusion out of the issue here. Uh, you, you are talking about the repair of the aortic valve. We do repair aortic valves for insufficiency. Not for, not for stenosis. For insufficiency, we do repair it. Stenotic valves with a lot of calcification, they have to be replaced, or a TAVI valve has to be placed. Uh, we do repair valves, yes, but we do that when we have uh, severe regurgitation, we have no calcification, and they are suitable for repair. And there are other techniques, no try. We don't try to make three leaflets out of it. Some, some people in the past there have tried. The term, the term. Anyway, okay. anyway, thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Van Meegem, uh, yeah. after all these things have been said, uh, do you have to make any comment? Well, I think the most important uh, comment is that uh, we are not proponents, we are collaborators, and uh, you, also, you always have to address this in a multidisciplinary hard team approach. I think what is changing now and what is different from uh, a couple of years ago is that a CT scan is becoming mandatory to come up with a wise decision for each patient. And I think the CT will drive the patient uh, where to go, whether it, go, whether it is surgery or uh, uh, catheter-based therapy. And I think um, the moment uh, the decision is made that the patient will not be treated with a mechanical prosthesis, then uh, the importance of the CT scan only becomes bigger. And then it is difficult now to to put a number there, what the percentage of bicuspid patients would be that would be sent for surgery or sent for a catheter-based therapy. But if in terms of calcium, in terms of dimensions, and in terms of uh, aortopathy, um, TAVI is a feasible solution, then I think you need to inform your patient that um, there is a less invasive alternative to surgery. And, and uh, before I give the, the microphone to Sushil, uh, you have to acknowledge that uh, there is a safety advantage with TAVI from a procedure perspective. So there is less mortality, less stroke with TAVI, um, and uh, at one year there is less rehospitalization after TAVI. And this is the information that you need to give. And again, the CT needs to tell you whether TAVI is safe and whether the result with TAVI would be no PVL. And that is also important. So, Sushil. Is there any, any, any cut-off diameter at the level of the ring or at the level of the sinuses 
that will switch you away from the TAVI so I, on the bike uh, hospital. Yeah, so in terms of the, at the annual level, yes, so you have the sizing charts, chart, so you know that uh, between um, 18 and 30 millimeters, you're quite good with, uh, with tower. If you exceed the 30 millimeters at the annual level, then it becomes a tricky thing. And then, especially in low risk patients, then I would definitely opt for surgery. Um, and for the, for the sinuses, uh, if, the, if the surgeon would say, listen, we will also take care of the ascending aorta, then, then it's a done deal. Then, then the patient needs to get surgery. But um, a lot of the times the surgeon also refrains from uh, more complex surgery and they say, no, we're just going to take care of the aortic valve for now. Well, then Tavi again becomes an option. I'm sorry, Sushil. But I think the issue here is that the aortopathy that is associated with the bicuspid valve, it is, un, it is very, very difficult to diagnose when there, one does exist and there is, if there's not a ascending aorta issue, then I think we feel very confident that perhaps, you know, all that Nicholas said is, is real. But I find it difficult because I know that there is a very good association of the bicuspid aortic valve with aortopathy. And, and sometimes we just don't have the very best ways of diagnosing it, such that you might go ahead and um, use a TAVR because you just don't see an issue with the ascending aorta. And if you don't see the issue, it doesn't mean that one doesn't exist. And so that's the difficulty, I think, that we all have in evaluating what to do for these patients. And I'm hoping that there'll be some biomarker or something that helps us make those judgments better. Yeah, no, I think you're, you're absolutely right. Even the top you, you made an excellent point. Even the surg surgical literature is vague. The guidelines have when to replace because it's not the size. It's is it going to impact the, the outcomes? But getting back to Nicholas's point, I think the CT is key, but one of the big challenges on top of it, it it's, it's there with the tricuspid valve, but it's even more amplified with the bicuspid valves, are, is that, you know, surgically, the treatment is pretty similar across valve types, right? You remove the valve, you sew in one, it's rather surgical valve. With the TAVI devices, the interaction of the device to the annulus to the valve is very different across the TAVI devices. So how are we going to study bicuspid valves? It's not, it, it's, Tavi with uh, an evolute with a sapien with a lotus are all going to be different in a bicuspid, uh, and they may not interact with the bicuspid the same. So one may be more effective than another. So part of the studying it is, you know, in certain anatomies, one device may work while others won't, and and you know we're not going to. It's going to be impossible to get all that data, but we have to uh, we have to keep that in mind that it's not. TAVI, it's TAVI with a specific de device maybe working in one scenario, but not in another. And I think that's one of the challenges I see as well. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Morales. Thank you very much. Uh, Gregory, you want to say Very quickly. So I'm, I'm going to speak very quickly because, uh, you know, we have to keep on time here. We have a lot of great talks. I think all of these issues bring, bring into my mind one of my kind of pet peeves. I'm a big fan of uh, TAVR. But one of my pet peeves is a patient who has two or three problems, and in order to avoid surgery, we're going to solve only one of them. So you have uh, mitral regurgitation, and you have an aneurysm of the ascending aorta, and you have aortic stenosis, and we're going to treat your aortic stenosis. My, my goal is to take care of all of the problems that a patient presents to me with. And I think most of us can, can agree there. It's only a matter of defining when a problem becomes a problem, when the ascending aorta becomes a problem, when the mitral regurgitation becomes a problem, when by fixing the uh, aortic stenosis, the mitral regurgitation is gonna go away. So I think that's the area of debate, but I don't think anybody has any debate that when a patient comes with three problems that all have an indication for intervention, that we should solve all, th all three, usually. Thank you.